Hello, eighth grade students. We are continuing our read of The Greatest Treasure Hunt in History, the story of the Monuments Men. We are beginning on um, page 130, chapter 10, Longings. And uh, it's set uh, in Paris, France, Christmas time, 1944. Blowing wind mixed with record low temperatures did nothing to dampen Jim Rohmer's enthusiasm. Jacques Jajard had wanted him to meet with Rose Valland. Now, just a few days before Christmas, this matronly looking woman wearing small wire rimmed glasses was standing next to him, chain smoking. While they shivered outside waiting for the manager of the warehouse, for enemy property to arrive with the keys. The process of earning Valon's trust began six days earlier with Rormer's discovery of several paintings and engravings inside a US military facility. Following protocol, he promptly delivered them to the Jeux de Palme Museum, now the headquarters of the French Commission for the Recovery of Works of Art and its secretary, Rose Valand. The artworks weren't terribly important, but the act of turning them over to the commission surprised Valand. Thank you, she had told him. Too often, your fellow liberators give us the painful impression they have landed in a country whose inhabitants no longer matter. Being at the Jeux de Palme Museum that day provided Rormer with a chance to visit with the leader of the commission. Albert Henry, who, like Jajard, suggested Rohmer and Valon cooperate to find France's stolen treasures. But Henry had gone one step further, handing Rohmer a list containing the addresses of nine buildings in Paris, mostly apartments and one warehouse used by the ERR. After scanning the list, Rohmer wondered aloud who had compiled the information. Henri smiled. Mademoiselle Valand, of course. Henri then nudged the persistent curator, suggesting that he enlist the help of Valand to inspect each address. Rohmer and Valand visited six of the nine locations several days later. Their search produced little, but the time they spent together proved invaluable. Over coffee between stops at the ERR apartments, Valon gradually revealed some of what she had been seen during her four years as Jajard's spy. Wormer soon had no doubt that Jajard and Henry's suspicions were true. Rose Valon did know much more than she had told the commission. It all made sense. Every day for four years, Valon had entered the den of thieves, observed their operation, and compile secret notes about the day's activities. With German soldiers watching her by day and the Gestapo trailing her at night, she somehow avoided being caught. It was hardly surprising that she guarded her notes so closely. More than just pieces of paper, they defined her life. Since arriving in Paris, Rohmer had gathered every piece of information he could about the Nazi looting operation. Although the ERR took its name from Nazi party ideologue Alfred Rosenberg, it was Nazi Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, the second most powerful man in all of Germany, who quickly commandeered the operation. ERR operatives served as deal makers loyal to him and his burgeoning art collection. Now Rohmer had an opportunity to hear from the only person who could describe these events as they happened. Rose Valand had much to say. Within months of the invasion of France in May 1940, the Nazis had converted the Jean de Palm Museum into a concentration camp for works of art. The atmosphere around me changed immediately with the arrival of the German trucks loaded with stolen works of art, Valand explained to Rohmer. The rooms and offices were immediately occupied. The Luftwaffe soldiers carried in the crates that they had been escorting. The unpacking started the next morning. Paintings by old masters were passed from hand to hand 
until the human chain ended at a support wall. Some of them were dropped and ended up underneath the boots, but the order was to proceed as quickly as possible. The sheer volume of paintings, sculpture, drawings, and furniture that passed through the doors of the museum was one thing. The quality of it was different. Valon, with her nearly photographic memory, made mental lists of incoming masterpieces by some of the most famous old master painters, including Vermeer, Raphael, and Velazquez. Hours later, German troops would barge through the door with another group of priceless paintings by the most revered Impressionist artists, such as Monet, Renoir, and Degas. Although Hitler had declared works by the Impressionists degenerate, they might still prove valuable in trades. With her teeth gritted in anger, she watched Nazi officials mishandle these degenerate works and place them in a rear area of the museum, a room Voland referred to as the Room of Martyrs. After a long drag on a cigarette, Voland looked at Rohmer and summed up the scale of the problem. France and its art world represented for the Nazi leaders a vast and inexhaustible hunting reserve, jealously guarded and managed. When Rohmer mentioned that Jajard had estimated during one of their visits that the Nazi looters stole more than 20,000 works of art from private collectors in France, Valand responded with a wry smile. They took far more than 20,000 objects, she said. France was powerless to stop them from taking all that they wanted. What more could the French have done? What could anyone have done when the Nazis issued decrees stripping French Jews of their right to own private property? How do you protect private collections from the greed of Reichsmarschall Goring? who is willing to use his position and influence to do anything to add to his personal art collection. So situation impossible, Warmer agreed. It was an impossible situation. Each time Bruno Loos, one of Goring's art buyers, Hermann Bunges, a corporate conscience official, and Colonel Kurt von Baer, commander of the Jus de Pomme and local leader of the ERR, appeared at the museum a flurry of activity quickly followed. They began by displaying the most recent arrivals, paintings, furniture, and tapestries that had been seized from Jewish collectors. Chill champagne and hand-rolled cigars were at the ready. A period of calm followed. Everyone waited. The sound of car tires crushing gravel, the squeal of brakes, car doors opening and closing, and the echo of heavy boots confirmed Goring's arrival. While his Luftwaffe was flying nightly bombing missions over London, trying to knock Britain out of the war, Goring decided to add to his art collection. The scene was repeated with slight variation on each of his subsequent 19 visits. Rohmer shook his head in disbelief. 20 visits by the master thief, and Rose Valland had been there to witness each one of them. Goring would slowly approach each work of art with the arrogance of an emperor, sometimes jingling loose emeralds in his pockets as normal people do coins, speaking in hushed tones to his group. Occasionally a painting or piece of furniture was so famous, such as Vermeer's masterpiece, The Astronomer, assigned the ERR inventory code R1, the first object stolen from the Rothschild collection that Goring had no choice but to reserve it for Hitler and the Führer Museum. The next best he took for himself. Once he made his choices, the items were crated, packed on trucks, and driven to his personal train to accompany him back to the fatherland. A final spasm of looting occurred in August 1944 during the final days of Nazi occupation with the loading of 148 cases of stolen art onto five railway boxcars. Each that day, the departure of the art train was postponed because of delays in loading 46 other boxcars filled with furniture and personal belongings stolen from the homes of Paris's Jews as part of a separate looting project known as M Action. As the Allies approached Paris, Valon secretly met with Jajard. With the train number, destination of the art crates, and their contents all in hand, she pleaded with Jajard for French resistance fighters to sabotage the train engines or simply reroute it. 
the resistance did their job well. Train number 444 and its contents remain trapped in Paris. The five boxcars containing the 148 crates of art were unloaded and taken to the Louvre and the Jeux de Palme museums, but the contents of the other 46 boxcars eventually offloaded and stored at the warehouse for enemy property went largely ignored. Now Rohrmer and Vallon had come to inspect it. After a brief introduction, the manager invited them inside the warehouse. Within the cavernous space, wooden crates, one stacked upon another, towered 40 feet into the air, as far as they could see. Uncrated chairs and tables rested on top, taken in such haste that the thieves hadn't had time to pack them. As they walked through the warehouse, they saw pianos, radiators, mirrors, pots, pans, children's toys, even ladies' nightgowns, all that remained of Paris's once vibrant Jewish community. Rohrmer felt gut punched. The Nazi theft of priceless works of art had involved stealing from the rich for the most part. This discovery evidenced quite the opposite, petty thievery of personal belongings on an industrial scale, priceless in their intrinsic value, looted from thousands of France's most vulnerable citizens. But the sick feeling in the pit of his stomach went deeper than just his role as a monuments officer. Decades earlier, his father had changed the spelling of the family name from Rohrheimer because of his concerns about anti-Semitism in American life. The people whose possessions were stacked in rows before him, Jim Rohrmer was also a Jew. The warehouse was as likely, was a likely place to find at least a few of the works of art stolen from France. Finding none, Romer felt disappointed. He struggled to make sense of not finding anything. Balan's lack of surprise convinced him that she'd known all along what was inside the warehouse and what was not. Then another realization hit him. While he had been inspecting the nine apartments in one warehouse, Balan had been inspecting and watching him. What was this cat and mouse game she seemed to be playing? As they exited the building, Rohmer decided to press Fallon for specific information about where the Nazis had taken the art masterpieces, even as she quietly walked ahead of him. When she didn't respond, he asked again, this time with an edge to his voice that caused her to stop. Slowly she turned, faced him, and curtly said, I'll tell you where, when the time is right. So let's take a moment to go back and look at a couple of the photos uh, in this chapter. Um, on page 135, you see the Nazi um, rights marshal Goring examining a painting. So here he's arrived and war is going on throughout Europe. And he is traveling as if nothing is going on to look at paintings that he's stolen, that he's had people steal for him, and have champagne celebrations. Terrible. And then here is one of the famous paintings, um, Vermeer's The Astronomer from 1668. That was painted in 1668. And it is one of the paintings that was stolen. Um, here we have Goring admiring two stolen paintings by Henry Matisse. And I know you're familiar with Matisse from things that Ms. Hill and Ms. Stanton have shared with you um, during one of his visits to the Jeux de Palme and one of the Nazi Germany's art buyers looking at the paintings. And then this is a picture of inside the warehouse where they went to look to see if any of the paintings were located there. And one was very disappointed because it's, it's furniture and chairs and belongings, clothing, toys, but not the paintings. And so he's wondering why Ms. Valland is not sharing more with him. 
We'll read just a little bit more. Um, page 138, near Metz, France, Christmas time, 1944. It didn't take long for Robert Posey and everyone else who heard that first radio report to realize that the German incursion into the Ardennes forest was a major offensive. The attack succeeded in catching General, General Eisenhower and his commanders by surprise. Hitler had gambled that his troops could split two of Eisenhower's armies and mount a lightning fast charge to the Belgian port of Antwerp, a crucial source of supplies for US and British forces. Horrific fighting and the harshest possible winter conditions created mounting losses and a need for additional forces and replacement troops. Robert Posey immediately volunteered. His instructions were simple. Keep firing until you can't fire anymore. And that's exactly what he did. Right up until the time he stepped in a snow-covered hole and broke the arches on both of his feet. Liege, Belgium, Christmas time, 1944. Walter Hancock spent Christmas Day in Liege, Belgium, trying to enjoy a bath. War respected no holidays, though. When a nearby explosion shook the building, he leapt out of the hot water, got dressed in record time, and hurried toward the bomb shelter. By then, the attack had ended. Dressed for the day, he decided to attend Mass in St. Paul's Cathedral. Another bomb attack cut the service short. He did manage to get a haircut without interruption and catch a quick meal before heading to the bomb shelter to try and sleep. Despite the danger and disruptions, Hancock knew he had it far better than the boys on the front line, trying to find safety from German bullets and winter weather just as lethal in some shallow, rock-hard foxhole. As he shifted back and forth trying to get comfortable on the cold, hard floor, Hancock's thoughts drifted to his wife, Sema, as they did every night. It seemed impossible to believe that they had been apart for more than 11 months especially after 20 years of friendship. Then he thought about the Polish soldier bunked next to him days earlier. The poor fellow hadn't seen his family for six Christmases. He's discouraged, Hancock had written Sema, but we are guaranteeing him this will be their last away from home. Hancock hoped that would prove true, but who knew? We're going to stop there on page 139 and we'll begin next time on Florence at Florence, Italy, Christmas time 1944 on page 140. Thank you so much. See you next time. Take care of yourself. Bye.